talk, the microphones are already in the public, okay? Those are the ones that are for the public. Okay, and this is forward, right? Yes, yes. That Just give me that, but that one, okay. Just give me a minute because I have the, I have the first. Yeah, I have, no, you're gonna go first, right? Oh, perfect, yeah. Okay, and that's then, always uh, this is seemingly <laughs> Test. So we each have Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you want me to just introduce you all? Yeah? Just so... Do you want me to say where you're from? <laughs> no, I'll just introduce you. Ladies and gentlemen, this must be one of the first sessions that's going to start on time. Uh, <laughs> And this is, a, uh, this is synonymous with ICANN, you know, we're very, very precise. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a session hosted by the Internet uh, Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Thank you very much for coming. We've got uh, two or three sessions this week, and we, we do, uh, you'll be very welcome to them, of course. Uh, this session is organized by the uh, ICANN board. Uh, and we have three members of the ICANN board and one member of the ICANN uh, executive with us. Uh, so, uh, Avery, uh, you're very welcome. Uh, uh, David, uh, Tripti, and Marik. And without further ado, I'll hand you back to the panel. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining. and. Uh, I'll open the discussion by framing the conversation. We will uh, focus on ICANN's uh, continuing role in the security and stability of the internet. And uh, of note, while we speak, is notice the scale and the complexity of, of this global pa pa platform. It continues to get bigger and bigger and more complex. So I'll take you through a series of slides, and then my colleagues will each give 10-minute uh, talks on the same topic, coming from various and sundry angles. And at that point, uh, we will open it up for discussion. So um, the internet has grown tremendously since its uh, inception. And uh, along with that, um, the scale has brought all kinds of security issues. Um, nation states are now taking, are aware of this, are legislative and regular, regulatory, uh, regulatory initiatives that come to play. And there are other emerging platforms that depend on this uh, internet, on the internet as well. So we'll take you through some slides to talk about it. And I'd like to take you back in time to show you where we were and how we got here. So it started in the 1960s. This is what I call a decade of technology nascence and bold vision. This was when the ARPANET was conceived and Joseph um, Lechleider, um uh, defined this very bold vision, put this in context in 1960s when he talked about an intergalactic network. So, th and in, there was no concept of an internet at the time. So this is 1960s when some really, really bright people were coming up with some very bold vision, visions as well as um, um, new technologies were being defined. And in the 70s is when this, um, a vision is being is evolving, and uh, TCP/IP is being specified. Um, believe it or not, email was written in the 1970s. The Unix operating system was also written in the 70s, and in 80s is when there's a decade of adoption, and that begins with TCP/IP becoming a standard, and the DNS system is invented and created at that time, and many other uh, activities are going on. And then comes the 1990s, and this is when I say. And then there was the internet. What happens is HTML is um, specified at the time and the browser wars take place, Mosaic and, and the others, you know, Netscape and so forth um, take, take foot. And that's an important decade because that's when we have a UI, a user interface that brings you into, that helps you connect to the internet and brings those resources to you. Can I see the slides? Thank you. Um, 
And uh, this is, so this was when it actually gains traction and um, the in the United States, the 1996 Telecommunication Act occurs under the Clinton administration and that's when um, it's opened up for competition and in 1998, um, ICANN has created, DNS is monetized. So there's tremendous energy in the ecosystem, things are beginning to take off. And then today, 20, 2019, look at the world today, 7.7 .7 billion people, four and a half people, four and a half billion connected to the internet. And that doesn't include the IoT devices. So we're, we're looking at billions and billions of connected people and devices to the internet, and this is continuing to grow. So this is one of my favorite slides. When you look at the left-hand side, it says a while back, there was nothing. And today, we're looking at 4.5 billion people connected and more growing. Tomorrow, we're going to be even bigger in scale and in size and in complexity. So there were some foundational principles that built the internet when it was uh, in the early days when it was being specified. It was, there was a need for it to be open and interoperable. It was important to be open because that's where innovation occurs. When you, uh, your standards and your specifications are open to the public, you know, Things happen, the innovation ecosystem kicks in and things begin to be built and you know, great minds begin to create things. And it had to be a support change and be dynamic, not rooted in some old concept. And it needs to be flexible and adaptable. These were the underlying foundational principles of when these technologies were being built. So there are many, many uh, uh, blocks to the internet, as you know, how, it, how it's created. There's um, the DNS system, which is ICANN's main mandate. This media, transmission media, there's a fiber optics, there's copper cable, there's air, there's satellites, all kinds of things that are just transmitting, using this media to transmit it. Then the protocols like TCP, IP, UDP, HTTP. And then there's you know, client servers that create your applications. And then there's the, uh, the user interface, which is what the user community uses to connect to the services that live on the internet. So all this comes together to build the, the internet. So this is one of my favorite um, slides. We call it the, I call it the transportation event on the uh, internet. What happens at a very, very fundamental level when you go beyond the application at a very fundamental level? There's only one event occur occurring on the internet, which is Something goes from point A to point B. You have an address, it takes data from that address to another address. So that is happening trillions of times every second around the world at, at an amazing speed. With this uh, event and with the internet, we've seen a growing trend in secu um, security threats. There's um, DDoS, which you're all familiar with, denial, uh, distributed denial of service attacks, there's hacking, there's phishing and spam, malware, ransomware, all this grew with the growth of the internet. All kinds of new threats have come to play, which were not on the horizon when it was first created. So I'd, I'd like to take you through uh, what I call the segmented view of the internet. It's at a very high level of abstraction. So um, it, I break it into three layers. At the bottom layer is what we call the transport layer. That's where this event is occurring, where things go from point A to point B. And on top of that are the systems and applications that enable this event. That's where things are beginning to happen. And then the internet user, the application interface, lives at the very top. And that's where most of us live, which is, in the slide you see the lady who's looking at at a, at a computer, and that takes you through, I'll take you through these different layers and explain what happens and how important it is for us to continue to secure this interface, this um, a construct, and stabilize it and ensure it's um, resilient. So I'll start with the bottom layer, and the bottom layer is where this event occurs, which is point A to point B. Things need to move, and this happens because of the resolution of the domain name system of the, of the DNS, where a, a, a a, a name is translated to an IP address, and this then triggers that event to go, um, data begins to move from point A to point B, and it moves through various um, media and through exchange points, and it, it goes from its source uh, destination to where it, needs, where it needs to go to, where it's uh, destined to go to. So that's what's happening at this very base layer, and this is happening, happening all over the world, all the time, trillions and trillions of such packets. Then moving up this layer is what, um, is what we call this, um, the system layer where uh, applications are being uh, hosted on servers and systems. And in today's world, 
the IT commoditization has led to cloud service environments. So you've got all kinds of clouds. We're all very familiar with them. Google, you know, eBay, Amazon, so on and so forth. And what we've done in this new environment is we've created a shared security fate because we're putting all our eggs oftentimes in one basket. And we rely on some other third party to secure us. And this is an increasingly distributed uh, computing environment. I'm moving up to the highest layer, which is where most internet users live, which is your window into the internet. It could be a laptop, it could be a mobile device, but that's where your UI is. And it's very important that we ensure that the, the integrity of that interaction remains and also uh, remains in good health and also that we as internet users take responsibility for what I call personal cyber hygiene and awareness, making sure that our passwords are strong, that uh, we update our software and hardware and um, we are backing up our data. And in general, there is awareness that you know, this is the world we live in and how do we interact with, this, um, uh, with the internet. So this took place in about 40 years or so from the 1960s to where we are now. We have entered yet another inflection point. And when you look at the rate of innovation and where the world is today with the growth of the internet, there's yet another inflection point that we're in. So there's the Internet of Things that we all know about, where just about everything is being Internet-enabled, whether it's refrigerators to cars to who knows what, the instrumentation of science, where scientific um, uh, science is occurring with instruments, which in turn are Internet-enabled, which generate lots of data. This 5G mobile that's um, come into the world today, sensor networks, where you put up these ad hoc networks to do things like maybe uh, check your climate, uh, measure temperature in a room. Then these new other technologies, blockchain, you're hearing less about that, but then there's Doe, which is a new thing in the DNS space, big data, I'll talk about that. Now with the uh, internet enablement of various devices, lots and lots and lots of data is being created. And then there's artificial in, uh, learning, uh, intelligence and machine learning. So what's happened with that is um, GPU technologies have advanced tremendously where AI about 30 years ago was more of a concept. There wasn't a whole lot you could do with it, but today it's a game changer. And machine learning is a real thing when you look at um, intelligent cars and intelligent this, that, and the other. And then there's who knows what's coming around the corner. There is, uh, for those of you who might be interested, quantum networking and quantum computing. Quantum computing is actually a thing. It's become something. Networking is taking off as well. So this is yet another um, inflection point which is going to change our world. So I'd like to speak about data. And um, in academia, they look at the 10 Vs of data, and I talk about them in pairs. So there's lots of data being uh, generated today. And there's volume, lots of it, and it's coming in at a velocity, a very high pace, because there's so many devices generate data now, and you can bring them down from where they could be satellites, they could be DNS, um, um, gene sequencing machines, um, there's a point of sale machines, there's a log files, there's so much data. There's a variety of them. I just went over the various varieties of uh, data that we have today. And there's variability that comes with them. They're, all, they're not necessarily um, standardized in their format. And then there's the veracity of the data, which is the prov provenance or the genesis. Where did this data come from? How can you attest the veracity? And the validity, which is how valid is, it, is this data and how can it be applied? And vulnerability, I think we all know about that. You know, your data gets exposed, suddenly you're vulnerable. So there's an aspect of data that we had not thought could impact us personally. Volatility, what's the shelf life of data? When do we say it's obsolete and no longer of use to us? Visualization, this is very powerful. Data tells you a story. A visualization technology has advanced quite a bit. And you take the data and you put it into these um, visualization engines and it begins to tell you a story of what's there and what are the interrelationships with different sets of data. And ultimately, value. This is really, really important. You know, 100 years ago, gold had value. Today, data has a lot of value. And you will see that increasingly. Hackers go out of data, go after data. It's all about data in today's world. And um, the one thing I forgot to mention on the right-hand side, we talk about data, it's important that you secure it, there are privacy issues, and you need to give access. Access to the right people using the right methodology. 
moving on, this is the world. This is the world of I I internet of things and artificial intelligence. We live in a world where just about everything is internet enabled. And with that, you do some intelligence behind it, and then you, you have these different devices speaking to each other, in turn communicating to you. So you could have your refrigerator send you a text message to say, hey, look, we're low on uh, milk. And your car, you know, does all kinds of cool things today and how it drives and, you know, self tells you, it makes decisions for you while you're driving. So this is the world we're moving to. So in this very complex world, what are the outcomes on ICANN as the internet continues to grow? So we know the growth is going to bring more addresses, more domain names. Policy articulation will continue. So the multi-stakeholder model will continue to be heavily engaged in the creation of these policies. And security, which used to be an afterthought, now needs to become a forethought. And risks, attacks, and so forth is something that we are very conscious of. We've got a risk register. We need to look at what's around the corner. So these are things that um, are impacting ICANN as, as the internet continues to grow. So in the DNS system, as you know, resolution occurs at the highest level at the root. This is another system that needs to grow. I call your attention to the little circle that says root. That's the one, uh, the zone file that actually is where things are resolved. But it's, it, it lives in a highly distributed system across the world. So that system needs to continue to bend and flex and change with the growth of the internet. And the underlying pr uh, uh, principles that need to be preserved going into the future for ICANN is for ICANN to support this transportation event where things go from point A to point B. Identifiers have to be unique. And this um, integrity is achieved with the unique namespace. The second thing is names and addresses will continue to grow. So the coordination of, this, uh, of the system that manages this, the DNS, will uh, also continue to grow with associated policies. And internet security is now absolutely paramount and key in all of this. So the impact on ICANN is the integrity of the resolution needs to march lockstep with the scale and the increased complexity of a bigger internet. I just went through what's happened to it today. This needs to continue to happen. The DNS root service, uh, service system needs to continue to um, evolve with the scale. And ICANN needs to keep its eyes, and it is keeping its eyes, on the risks and the security profile of this new landscape. And the, of course, ICANN's delivery uh, on its mission um, with the multi-stakeholder model continues to grow. It is complex because of how this internet is growing. So for the foreseeable future, the internet's not going anywhere, it's going to continue to live with us. So it needs to be secure, open and interoperable. We can't close it we, because that's where innovation occurs. And it needs to continue to be um, support change and be dynamic and flexible and adaptable. And I'd like to end on this one note, which is for this in internet to be resilient and to be what it is today, we have to preserve a single unique namespace. That's absolutely critical for this global population of what is today 7.7 .7 billion people, for us to all use the single internet, the single platform. We've got to preserve the single unique namespace. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Marike, who's going to continue on the same tone. Hello, everyone. And while the slides get going, um, I am on the Security Stability Advisory Council of ICANN, and I'm the uh, SAC liaison to the board. And so I will be talking primarily on some of the uh, security aspects. Um, because one of ICANN's uh, uh, primary missions is to uh, uh, support the security, stability, and reliability of the Internet's unique identifier systems. So let me see if... Yeah, yeah, so he's still bringing up the slides. So I was looking around the room, I was remarking it can't be just a technical room because in the most technical sessions, everybody's head is in their laptop. So, so. But um, yeah, so I'll be talking um, 
again, about the evolving C ecosystem and ICANN's role in the security and stability of the internet. And it really takes a village, right? ICANN is multi-stakeholder, and you can see with this slide what multi-stakeholder actually means. It means everybody. Everybody in this room is part of the multi-stakeholder model. Whether or not uh, you're uh, part of the registry or registrar, which is um, uh, the folks that actually give you your names, whether or not you're an operator or a hosting provider, whether or not you're a network operator, an end user, whether or not you're in the Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF standards body, whether or not you write software, right? all of us are part of the multi-stakeholder model. And for the DNS to exist, there's a lot of parts and components to it, and it's fairly complex, but ICANN has the oversight to make sure that the multi-stakeholder model works and that we can preserve the security, stability, and resilience of the unique identifiers. So the issue, though, is that while the internet was created for good, right, anything that can be used for good can be used for bad, unfortunately. And so DNS has been a wonderful target for many attackers. And it's either the DNS operations or the DNS processes and policies. So we'll really have to take a look at where are some of the vulnerabilities and how can we continue to educate users, help with creating new technical standards and protocols so that we preserve the trust that we all have in the unique identifiers. I mean, that is very, very, very critical. And so uh, what I'm trying to show in this slide is that there are many, many points of targets uh, when it comes to the DNS. On the left side, you're mainly talking about um, the technical devices and the protocol itself, whereas on the right-hand side of the green line, it's more about the people and processes. So a stub resolver is really if you have your laptop or your phone and you're starting a query, let's say, to igf.org, right? Your stub resolver, my phone, is the one that would initiate that DNS query. It then goes to something called a recursive resolver. If that doesn't have the actual information that translates the names to a number, then it will go to an authoritative server. Okay, that's just the fundamental details of how the DNS protocol works. Now, there's many points of attacks there. So from my phone to the recursive resolver, if I'm looking for igf.org, right, somebody could potentially see what I'm querying. Now, igf.org isn't so nefarious, but some people might be searching for other places where they don't necessarily want people to know what they're looking up. Um, also, with recursive resolvers, uh, there's uh, the capability that somebody could create erroneous message in there so that when you're actually getting uh, uh, back um, information in terms of, oh, you're looking for igf.org, right, it sends you to a false site. Now, again, um, that's a problem because we're learning to trust everything in the Internet, so we want to make sure that you don't get what you, what's called cash poisoning, so where you can actually have fraudulent answers or people might be able to modify the data. Um, and so that's, from a technical level, what you want to uh, uh, make sure that you have protections against. Then on the right-hand side, you know, the registrant is all of us. Anybody that's creating a domain name, right, we're called the registrant. We will probably go through some user interface to what's called the registrar, who will then give us the domain. Well, how do I authenticate to that registrar? What credentials do I use to uh, change the name or, or create more records to that name? Or what if I want to point to a different authoritative server? So you always have to think about how do you authenticate yourself? Do you have integrity of the data, making sure that nothing's been changed in transit? And where do you want to have confidentiality? So you have to think about these uh, specific security items as you're thinking throughout the entire way, how you register a name, how you modify any of your uh, domain name information, and also how does it work uh, from a technical level as the data is transferred from one server to the other. So when we're looking at a more uh, secure DNS ecosystem, there's a lot of talk about DNSSEC. 
Well, DNSSEC is uh, one part of the solution. Right? DNSSEC allows for uh, making sure that um, you're, you're certain that the person that's giving you the domain name information is the right owner and also that nobody's spoofing the answer to you. And that's why it's extremely critical that people do implement DNSSEC, but even more important that you validate. Right? If you just uh, implement it, but you don't do anything with wrong answers, then you're not really utilizing it. And so there's also a lot of work being done in, in protocols to provide privacy, confidentiality, for if you're initiating a query and when you're getting the response back. And so you may have heard the uh, acronyms DOT and DO, domain over TL, uh, DNS over TLS, or DNS over HTTPS. So privacy is a concern. There's some consequences to using different technologies. And all I can say is make sure you really understand the technologies in detail so you understand how it fits into your environment. Um, and what's really, really important is to do basic security hygiene. Um, I have been dealing with security for 20 to 25 years, and I can unequivocally say that the very basic hygiene is something that most everybody still needs to work on. It's things like credential management. And what does that mean? Well, if you have a password, are you using the same password to log into 10 different sites? Right? Are you doing two-factor authentication, which in today's world you must do? I mean, it's a criticality. Technology needs to get better, but we're not there yet. So us humans have to get a little bit better also at being much more diligent in doing basic hygiene. So um, the Security Advisory Council was created a very long time ago when ICANN realized that you know, there really are going to be security issues. I believe it was started in the year 2000. And uh, there's a lot of advisories that the SSEC has written. Some are for the general community. Some are for the board to act on. Um, but the basic premise is to help the overall DNS ecosystem understand some best practices for security or inform the overall ICANN multi-stakeholder community. And so I've just listed some of them. If some of you are writing anything down, SAC 40, 44, and 74 are the real critical ones. So, um, and then I also pointed to the very last uh, point, uh, sorry, the last bullet is an announcement that came from ICANN Org this February. And it was an excellent announcement. I would also encourage you all to look at it and actually do what it says you should be doing as best practices for hygiene. Um, because this announcement came after some uh, very highly uh, publicized and critical DNS attacks. The, um, what's it called, Sea Turtle. I don't know who makes up these names, but Sea Turtle DNS espionage. And so really there's a lot of best practices that exist and ICANN.org also and ICANN community, right, are involved with really helping each other and the entire ecosystem to help each other get better with protecting our, our fundamental um, unique identifiers. So yes, this is the same slide as number two because it does take a village. It takes a village for the DNS to operate. It also takes a village for the DNS and the internet to be secure. So we all have a role to play. We are all in this together, right? The vulnerabilities in the DNS ecosystem can absolutely impact everyone. And so while like doing a protection with DNSSEC may not uh, uh, just impact you yourself, right, you have to think about other people as well. Um, and securing the DNS ecosystem requires cooperation amongst a wide array of actors and stakeholders. So some things are easy. I cannot stress enough basic hygiene. It is absolutely critical. And then also to look at implementing technology such as DNSSEC. ICANN has spent many years um, doing hands-on training on DNSSEC. At every ICANN meeting, they have a DNSSEC day. And also they help fund other um, entities who will go and give trainings, hands-on trainings for DNSSEC. 
So there's a huge role to play here. And one of the things I also want to mention was that um, because the attacks are growing and you know, we really have to work together and collaborate, ICANN is also working with the community to investigate mechanisms for strengthening collaboration and communication on the security and stability issues. So looking at the um, facilitation function that they can provide over the years to really help coordinate uh, across issues. So that's it for my section right now. So David. I'm uh, David Conrad, ICANN's uh, CTO. Um, thanks for being able to speak with you all today. Um, it's actually a nice segue, because um, I'm going to be talking about sort of the operational perspectives of ICANN's role uh, related to security and stability of the internet. Um, as many of you may know, uh, the uh, first uh, article of the first section of ICANN's mission um, in our bylaws states that um, we're uh, required to ensure the security and stability of the Internet's system of unique identifiers. Um, however, beyond um, a, uh, some contractual obligations that uh, apply to a relatively small set of stakeholders, namely the uh, generic tuple domain registries and the accredited registrars, um, ICANN.org doesn't have a whole lot of tools um, to perform our mission. Uh, we are um, fairly tightly constrained by our bylaws. Uh, to a limited set of activities. Uh, there are basically five activities that our bylaws uh, let us perform. One is to allocate and update the names in the root of the DNS. Uh, the second is to coordinate the development of policies uh, for generic second level domains uh, and implement those policies. Um, and that's for generic top level domains only. We do not have an ability to apply policies to uh, CCTLDs. Um, CCTLDs are considered uh, national sovereign resources and um, their, their policies are their own. We can make recommendations, we can ask nicely, um, but ultimately the CCTLDs can uh, do what they choose with, with their, uh, their country code top level domain. Um, we facilitate the coordination of the 12 root server operators. Um, we don't control any of the root servers except the one that we actually operate ourselves. Um, there are 12 independent organizations that provide root service that uh, Tripti had mentioned. Um, those uh, organizations um, are quite diverse. The intent uh, was actually to focus on that diversity for resiliency uh, and to avoid single points of failure. Um, ICANN uh, provides a, a coordinative service um, uh, through uh, the Root Server System Advisory Committee, another one of ICANN's uh, advisory committees. But beyond that, there are no formal agreements that dictate or allow ICANN to control how the Root Server uh, servers operate it. We um, uh, facilitate the coordination of the allocation of internet numbers. Those are IPv4 and IPv6 addresses and autonomous system numbers that are used by ISPs uh, to announce uh, information into the routing system. Um, we uh, hand that off to the regional internet registries. There are five regional, net inter five regional internet registries uh, for the European region. Uh, it's RIPE NCC, uh, APNIC for Asia Pacific, ARIN for the Americas, AFRINIC for Africa, and LACNIC uh, for Latin America. Um, they operate essentially autonomously. Uh, they come back to ICANN when they need additional address space or additional AS number blocks. Um, uh, but largely, um, they, uh, within their own communities, set their own policies uh, and ensure their own security and, and uh, stability. And finally, um, we provide uh, support for um, the, the uh, management of registries for standards development organizations, like primarily the IETF, although not exclusively limited to the IETF. I think there might be one registry that's not uh, IETF originated. Um, those are the only things that our bylaws allow us to do. Um, there are some things that our bylaws explicitly state we cannot do. One of those is to act outside our mission. Uh, we can't sort of make up stuff on the fly and then uh, do those things. Um, we also are not allowed to um, uh, impose rules or restrictions on services uh, that use those identifiers um, or the content such services uh, carry or make use of. And that's where things get a little sticky because a lot of folks would like us to get involved 
uh, in content regulation, things like um, uh, illegal ph pharmaceuticals or uh, uh, child porn or those sorts of things, ICANN does not have tools uh, to enable us to actually help uh, with those very much. We can talk to the registries, we can talk to the registrars, we can encourage people to do things, but ultimately um, ICANN cannot, by our own bylaws, uh, uh, regulate content in any way. So given we don't have a whole lot of tools and our bylaws actually constrain what it is that we actually do, um, how do we ensure the security and stability of the internet's identifier systems? Um, the simple answer is that we have to work with others uh, to do that. We, we must uh, build confidence in what ICANN does and how we do it. Um, because ultimately, um, ICANN.org is, is a, a trust-building um, organization. Um, we must provide the tools and the information necessary to the global multi-stakeholder community to allow them to have the trust in the Internet's identifier systems. Um, or uh, in cases where we uh, have work with others, um, you know, and doing steps that we cannot do ourselves, um, we have to rely on others to take those steps. So in order uh, to allow the community to build trust, um, we at ICANN.org must be open, transparent, and accountable. Um, that's something that has become a mantra within uh, the organization. You probably uh, hear it quite frequently. We do actually take it very seriously um, within the organization. Uh, we have to operate the IANA functions um, with excellence as verified by external parties. Um, as part of the transition, there was the creation of the, the customer standing committee. Uh, they review the IANA performance. Um, we uh, aimed uh, and try as hard as we can to provide unbiased, fact-based information to facilitate policy discussions. The, we're, uh, our, our goal is to provide only the information that will um, allow for uh, policy discussions to occur um, in a uh, neutral and biased fashion um, so that the policies uh, will be uh, able to be uh, facilitated in that way. Um, we have to support the community's deliberations in a neutral, objective fashion. We can't take sides. We can't put our thumb uh, on the scale of the policy discussions. Um, and we aim to improve the uh, knowledge and understanding by providing training, capacity building, best practices, uh, promulgation of best practices, and, and those sorts of things. Some of the ways we're actually trying to build trust, the concrete ways. Um, well, we uh, have, uh, since the uh, transition and even before, um, met uh, or exceeded all of the SLAs uh, for the IANA functions. Um, we, uh, and that's measured by the Customer Standing Committee. Uh, you can find reports that are provided to the CSC uh, on the IANA website, um, and in it you'll see that we uh, have either met or exceeded all the SLAs, or were, uh, the reason we were unable to meet those SLAs was explained uh, sufficient to uh, allow the CSC to, to uh, uh, allow us to move forward. Um, we make information about why, what ICANN does and how we do it open and available through our um, information transparency initiative and open data platforms. ITI is a project which basically is um, revamping the way we handle information within the organization. Uh, what people will see out of that will be uh, a new website that hopefully will allow people to find things unlike our, unlike our uh, current website. Um, also, we're deploying open data uh, as, a, as a practice within the organization. So we're going to be taking the data that we collect and make sure there's no uh, privacy implications associated with that data and making it available via APIs and uh, via a uh, open uh, data platform uh, to, be, to allow uh, the community to verify the things that we say we're doing, we're actually doing. Um, we worked with the community uh, to define and then later uh, refine um, the uh, mechanism to uh, actually track uh, security threats that are impacting uh, the Internet through the domain name system. The system, known as DAR, um, is currently in production. We produce monthly reports, um, and we're working with uh, the community to figure out how to improve that information, again, to facilitate the policy discussions, in this case, with respect to uh, domain name security. 
Um, we encourage uh, uh, the deployment of security technologies like DNSSEC that can help oper network operators and uh, end users crypto cryptographically uh, verify uh, identified area has not been uh, compromised. This is increasingly important as uh, the, uh, the bad guys are figuring out ways of taking advantage of the identifier system, leveraging that to uh, implement more sophisticated attacks and more successful attacks. The uh, uh, sea turtle tech that um, uh, America had mentioned um, has been quite successful and we're seeing uh, increased activities in that space. Um, that have occurred, uh, I think the initial um, release uh, that by Cisco Talos and CrowdStrike was uh, back in April. Um, there are uh, ongoing leveraging of the infrastructure that were used in C the Sea Turtle attack uh, to compromise things uh, like country code top level domains uh, and name servers uh, that allow the bad guys to cr harvest uh, credentials to allow uh, the bad guys uh, the attackers to gain access to um, anyone who has logged into any of the websites that were hanging off of uh, top-level domains or uh, large-scale uh, registries or registrars. Um, as part of our DNSSEC uh, efforts, we also um, uh, have extensively documented and implement, implement a, um, a very uh, elaborate key ceremony that's specifically designed to allow the community to see that um, there's uh, nothing going on underneath the covers, that everything that you see associated with DNSSEC at the top level is open and transparent. Um, if uh, you have a, a bad case of insomnia, uh, those key ceremonies are recorded. Uh, they can be up to four hours long. Um, they are guaranteed not to excite you very much. Um, and we implement, as feasible and appropriate, um, recommendations from the myriad of, of uh, community-based reviews that focus on how ICANN does uh, what we do and how we do it. Um, each one of those reviews uh, creates a set of recommendations, and those recommendations are provided to the board uh, for uh, uh, reviews of wh uh, whether they are implementable, how they can be implemented, and that sort of thing. Um, if you're interested in reviews, there are a lot of them going on. Um, the ICANN community uh, is uh, currently, I believe, undergoing uh, four separate reviews. Um, and uh, the recommendations uh, that come out of those uh, go through a public comment period, and I'd encourage uh, anyone to provide input on those public comments. So while some of these ways of improving the security and stability of the, of the DNS uh, from an operational perspective uh, are in place, for example, the Customer Standing Committee um, uh, has been consistently pleased with the IANA performance, um, other areas are under development. ITI, uh, the Information Transparency Initiative, is due to be uh, soft launched in April of this year. Um, the Open Data Platform is supposed to be uh, soft launched at the ICANN meeting in Cancun. Um, we continue to explain what ICANN does and por perhaps more importantly what we can't do um, and we always strive to improve our openness, transparency and accountability. In this way, we are working to try to improve the trust the community has and thereby allow us to obey um, our mission to ensure the security and stability of the Internet's unique identifier system. And with that, I will hand it over to Aubrey. Thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering if, um, I don't have my own slides, but I really liked one of Marike's slides, the one with the, with the village on, under attack. And I'm wondering if you could just put that one up for me while I'm talking, partially because it's a fascinating slide and partially because I don't want to look at my face uh, in the screen right in front of me. It, is so it really <laughs> is very distracting. So anyhow, you've, you, the, the three people before me that have spoken have, are, are, are all experts. If, if really, if we could get that, I don't know if you can find that slide, but, but really, yes, exactly. That is what I don't want to, it's bad enough that you have to look at it, but I don't want to. Um, so, so 
you've basically listened to three experts, security, the, the root system and the architecture, and, and, and operational. I'm the generalist of the bunch. Um, basically, I'm not an expert at any of those things. And, and really what I kind of want to do is sort of look at this more tied back into some of the, the other work that, that's being done in the environment in here. I want to tie this back to, for example, you know, uh, the, of the three themes, you know, we're, we're definitely with, within ICANN and the conversations we're having. Uh, looking at the, you know, the stability and, and, and security, I think th those were even the specific words. And, and we're very focused on that. But one of the things I also started looking at is one of the documents that, that people have been talking about here, the uh, Global Commission on Cybersecurity. Uh, we've been looking at that. And, and, and one of the things that, that I saw is internet users were mentioned internet users, which I think we all are when we go home at night. And as whichever of the village functions that we've got, we, we are all users. And so in looking at that, how did what, what is offered in there as sort of a framework, how does ICANN sort of look at those things? And, and in the conversations that we've already had, we've already gotten clues. For example, the first one it puts is that, that you have to be multi-stakeholder. And, and ICANN makes probably one of the most um, extensive efforts I don't want to go beyond what the IGF does, but, but extensive efforts of being an organization that does work in the world, that makes decisions, that has operational responsibilities, and basically carrying them out in a multi-stakeholder manner. The multi-stakeholder model is constantly evolving. I think any of you, and I think many of you, are already involved in ICANN, but I can't see that well with the light in my eye. But, um, you know, some of you aren't. But we're constantly undergoing a review of our multi-stakeholder processes to try and figure out what could be better, how can we improve it, wh where can we learn from things that have gone well in the past and things that haven't gone so well. Certainly you've heard a lot about the work being done specifically on cyber stability. We didn't use those terms, but that is indeed what this work is, is sort of how do we have an underlying architecture, an underlying uh, unique name system that basically works, that, that, that is secure. Voluntary norms that, that they talk about. Almost everything that goes on inside ICANN is a set of voluntary norms, is based upon a set of voluntary norms that the multi-stakeholder policy process has worked on, has put together, looks at, reviews, alters, and, and such. So, you know, a, another one of those basic framework principles that we find a strong dedication to. International law, if you look at the, the, the efforts that have been made with GDPR and other things over the year is, over the past couple of years, is the efforts that, that ICANN makes to not get in trouble, the, 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 to make sure that, our, that the registries and registrars that are in different locations, that are subject to different international laws, subject to different national laws, do not get in trouble, are able to operate within the law, have certain policies. It says, no matter what the policy is, if it's going to break your law, you don't have to, and there's a way to work around it. So, so basically, a very strong commitment to that. Confidence building. It was one of the things that, was, that David was talking about, is, is trust. How do we build that trust? How do we try and get it? You know, trust is, is, is one of those things are really hard to hold on to. You have to keep trying. It's really easy to lose, and when you lose it, and, and we all do lose it at times, you have to find ways to get it back. You have to find ways to earn it again. And it is basically one of the tenets that we have of we have to try and hold on to trust, and where we don't have, to, where we don't have trust, we have to figure out how to try and get it back, how to try and get trust. It's something we talk about a lot, sort of abmorph. Thank you, was that the one? Yes, I love that. No, but, but there was also one 
that had a flying thing and something else. But anyhow, <laughs> I was looking at the picture and I never quite got enough of it. But thank you that, and thank you for making me no longer have to look at myself. Um, comf <laughs> thank you. Very nice. Uh, <laughs> They also invited me for the comic relief. <laughs> um, confidence building. Um, it, it, again, one of the things that David was talking about, one of the things that's very important is, is sort of the, how do we build confidence? How do we take something that's very esoteric? You know, it's, it's, it's the conversation of security, of cyber, of DNS architecture, of, of registries, registrars, how they all interact, and, and the protocol change. How do we get confidence in that? How do we make sure that we, you know, and that sort of goes to the next step is capacity building. It's one of the things that we're constantly doing with ourselves. We're constantly getting ourselves educated. There, there's a lot of work. It's part of what the internet users in civil society that are involved in ICANN spend an immense amount of time is sort of working with ICANN org on getting courses together, on getting instructions together, on doing outreach to various parts of the world to try and sort of explain what it is we're doing, explain how it involves them, explain what might be important about it, so, so that part. And then use of technical standards, you know, again, David and, and Mary Kay and Tripti all sort of pointed to whether it's the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force standards or others, how we're very committed to it. So that, that was one. Another part of that document looks into sort of four other words, responsibility, restraint, requirement to act, and then the human right, rights and respect for them. Those are again four things that, that, that I can sort of is, is very committed to. It is incredibly committed to its responsibility, but it also pulls the responsibility out of those that are interacting. It isn't only the technical folks that are, in, that are that have to be responsible. It's the internet users that have to be responsible. Uh, the, the, the allusion to, to hygiene, I always think of safe networking, but, but basically the notion of, of hygiene, the notion that as users, which all of us are, we also end up having a responsibility in terms of doing the right things to not allow our house to become a bot farm that's used for attack. And others, you know, we all have these lovely, there was, there was that one picture with the cars and the stuff and the, you know, the very first world problems of, of having all those IoT devices. Well, if those IoT devices that you bought aren't secure, then you possibly have created a wonderful attack vector and your house can be the attacker. That was one of the things that I liked about It Takes a Village. We're on both sides of that. The internet users can be the good guys, the internet users can be the bad guys, and some of the internet users are unfortunately, what's that term for it? Useful idiots. Uh, in terms of we're good guys, but the stuff we do opens up threats. By not being hygienic, as it were, by us not taking the responsibility to wash our hands before we go into the kitchen and cook food, we are spreading trouble. And so it really is very simple, and I really wanted to sort of drive that, that, that notion in further. The requirement to act, it's something that I can take very seriously, constantly looking at problems, constantly looking down the road, what is it we're gonna have to deal with, but it's also the responsibility of the users. What problems do you know of? And that's part of what they also do at ICANN, whether it's the private sector users, the, the civil society users, the users in the at large are constantly bringing the new problems in and saying, hey, you guys, you're not worrying about this yet. You have to start worrying about that. Hey, what you just did here might have that effect there. So again, that responsibility of acting, being on both sides of the ICANN equation of, you know, we at ICANN have to take care of it, but you as participants, as users, as people who may not be involved in, but people that send letters saying, hey, you messed up, that is your requirement to act, to tell us when we're doing it right, to tell us when we're doing it wrong. 
And then the final one was the respect for human rights. One of the great things about the transition that we just had is we managed to put in a, a, a framework for how I can, who doesn't create human rights, but how to try and live within human rights with, with an ICANN. So I just wanted to sort of take in a, an external set of, of criteria, not quite a metric, but something that, that is going around, a very useful document that anyone that hasn't read the GCSCs, and I have to look at something when I say it, I can never get those letters straight on my own. The Global Commission's Cybersecurity Report really should. It, 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 it isn't meant to be a, a, a model for ICANN, but, but I felt in reading it that it was something that we could look at and, and, and we could feel good about because it is, is the direction that we, that we work towards. And so I started out sort of saying that, that as users, we depend on the stability of cyberspace, but cyberspace also depends on us for its security. And so I'll stop and uh, probably went over my 10 minutes too. And basically we, we wanna open it up to people that might wanna say something to us, ask us a question, make a comment. Um, I, I don't see, uh, there is a mic, there's a couple microphones and feel free. Will, will you be the master of ceremony on microphones? Okay, thank you, Nigel. All right. And really any question on any of the topics or anything we didn't cover? Hi, um, I have a two-part question. Uh, why were the price caps on the .org TLD lifted despite massive community opposition? And then why is it being sold to a private equity firm? You know, we probably could have predicted that question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it was uh, something someone was going to ask. Right, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and basically, the only answer that I have for that is that it's something that's still being worked on, that, 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 that the contracts have been being put into place over years. It is, it is a model that, that, that has been, been worked on, and, and, and it's being reviewed at the moment, as, as you probably know, and therefore there's precious little we can say about it while it's in review. In terms of sales, I can has nothing to say about one company buying another. But wasn't the wasn't dot org tilde owned by the private uh, public interest registry, which operates under ICANN? No, no. No, the public interest registry was, is owned by the Internet Society, and it's the Internet Society that may end up selling it. So wait, so... Um, no, that's quite a right. And, okay. and it is a thing to, to talk about. And certainly, I'm sure people at the Internet Society would love to talk to you about why they're selling it. <laughs> and there's lots of them here. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Isabel Odidam from Uganda. You mentioned um, ICANN's support for human rights. And um, you also mentioned what ICANN can do, and I mean, what it does, what it can and what it can't do, including um, regulation and, um, yeah, regulation when it comes to our communities. Um, in regards to human rights, I'll talk, I want to ask about the internet shutdown because ICANN, um, I can't, the reason why we have internet is partly because of ICANN's work, but we, I come from a region where the governments decide to, I mean, when, when it comes to things like elections, they decide to shut down the internet. What has ICANN done to make sure that our rights are protected and that there is no internet, I mean, that there won't be any more internet shutdown when it comes to elections? Yeah, um, so in my slides, I had um, shown uh, or discussed 
although I didn't have slides, <laughs> um, <laughs> in, my, uh, in my talk, I had indicated that ICANN has, has five things that we do. Um, that is, you know, uh, manage the route, um, define policies associated with second level domains, um, allocate blocks of addresses and uh, numbers to uh, the internet registry, support the root server operators, and support standards organizations. Um, we're actually not allowed by our bylaws to do anything else. So th things like um, uh, taking some action, and I don't even know what action we could take in the face of internet uh, blockage by a national sovereign um, is just not within the realm of something that ICANN can do anything about. Um, individuals within ICANN, like anywhere else, will have opinions. Um, uh, we, uh, some of us may be active in trying to, in other organizations that are involved in trying to uh, get people to understand the implications of blockage, the, the costs uh, over the long term that that might imply to the economy, to the ability of people to make use of the internet. Um, but ICANN itself, we, we don't have a role in that. And in our human rights effort, what really is is that we must not do anything that infringes, that we must be aware of, of human rights. So certainly we can't do anything that, that breaks human rights, but we're certainly not a human rights enforcement agency. It's not one of the things that we can do, that we can go around actually trying to uh, do anything. We're not a government, we're not an intergovernmental, so we cannot do anything about the human rights infringements that others may do. We can only try and make sure that our actions are consistent with human rights. Yeah, the only thing I have to add that from a technical level, Right. Um, there's been some uh, 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 documents written by the Security Advisory Council just to understand any unintended consequences that any kind of blocking mechanisms would bring. And so just to understand any technical ramifications. Okay, so I understand you can't do that, but you have the power, right? Not to do that, but to create, I mean, to provide advice to the people that create these policies or the people that create these enforcements. Have you done that? Uh, so as America mentioned, the SAC, the Security and Stability Advisory Committee, um, has produced um, a document. We have um, in, uh, within the organization, um, we do uh, provide information to um, governments, to law enforcement, to um, uh, public safety organizations um, uh, throughout the, the regions in which we operate. Um, we don't uh, have, uh, a, you know, as an organization um, or as a community, we don't have an opinion, um, but we can provide those information to folks so that they understand the implications of the blocking um, and how they do the blocking, because how you do the blocking actually has an impact as well. I'd just like to add, you said we have the power. Um, I can remit, as uh, David said earlier, is um, very narrow. It's restricted to uh, managing the DNS. So we can certainly influence, and there is, it is a multi-stakeholder body, so there are many bodies that are talking about this, but we cannot act in that capacity, can't interfere in the workings of a sovereign nation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Abdi Karim. I'm from Nigeria. I want to um, give a comment and also ask a question. The internet world is actually evolving, and everything that has to do with the internet is evolving every day. But one thing that frustrates me is when organizations that are as, that are as powerful as I can come out and say, our bylaws does not allow us to do some things. Yes, I do agree with that, that there are some things that are outside the remit of ICANN. But when it comes to the domain name industry, when it comes to naming on the internet, ICANN has the power to do a lot of these things. And when this question gets asked, it is just that it is outside our remit. Content regulation, I do not subscribe to content regulation entirely but there has to be some ways of regulating some of this content by the domain name industry. 
ICANN has to take responsibilities for some of these things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, w one of the interesting discussions that we had at the last ICANN meeting was about DNS abuse. Um, there was a multi-stakeholder panel that was held and it was very clear that there was also consensus that within the multi-stakeholder community, there's hosting providers, right, and other entities that also have a responsibility to play. And so I will reiterate that I, there's a difference between ICANN, the organization, and ICANN, the multi-stakeholder community. And so there's sometimes a fallacy, and I heard this last night also, where I had to correct some, some, some statement, because ICANN org has to act under its bylaws because it doesn't want to be seen overstepping at bounds. That's a big problem. But we have to work in, within the multi-stakeholder community about how do we handle abuse. And content abuse is a very difficult topic because some people think, oh, you know, just, just block the domain. Well, that could have um, unintended consequences for any, any non-malicious uh, uh, content uh, that's actually part of that domain or being sourced with that domain. Um, then there's also, you know, for decades, people have been placing the blame on ISPs or hosting providers. It's a very difficult problem. I 100% concur that there have to be, uh, um, we have to do something about it. And one of the things that makes it so difficult is that what is malicious content is not always seen as malicious everywhere. There's some things that are very clearly malicious. So, but my, my feel is that really it is a multi-stakeholder issue, right? And I can org cannot by itself do anything about it, but this is where policies and working together with the Internet Jurisdiction Project, right, and with some other law enforcement entities and governments, I think it needs some kind of multi-stakeholder cooperation to figure out the problem. Yeah, and I'd uh, just like to add that um, in Montreal, the, where we had the ICANN meeting uh, a couple weeks ago, um, the session on DNS abuse um, was uh, had the largest number of people for any non-plenary session at ICANN ever, um, because there is a very significant interest in this particular topic. Um, and op the ICANN organization, um, we, as I mentioned, have to abide by our bylaws. However, the community has the ability to change our bylaws. So if the community wishes us to do something different, then they need to get engaged, they need to come to a consensus and basically tell us what to do. Yes, let me take us back to... Yes, my name is Dorothy Gordon, and I think you know me well. Um, work on many policy issues. Um, right now, of course, all the buzz is about the potential sale of the .org. Um, yes, it's true, it's not decided, but so far, what is being circulated has a lot of implications for the governance of ICANN and the limits on previous officers of ICANN who may have had access to privileged information. The other thing is, of course, the fact that it is the lifting of the cap on .org that now makes it possible for people to anticipate super normal profits from the sale of .org. So there are a lot of issues here. Um, the question is, can you head an organization or be a leader in an organization and leave, and then after arranging for something to happen, profit from the fact that it's happened. And I think these kind of governance issues at the level of ICANN have to be addressed because it erodes the credibility. The second thing is to do with content regulation. Yes, you don't regulate content, but the agreements that have been created with registries now allow registries to do that. And in good governance, we never have the same people who are judge jury, and there's no recourse. So you could anticipate abuse resulting from that situation. And it is always good for us to look at the models of good governance and try to emulate them. 
Insider deals are not good. We know that. Monopolies also are not healthy. We know that. Um, so I'm just throwing it to you because we all believe that there should be robust governance at the level of ICANN, and we are not happy when we see all these things circulating on the internet, which kind of erode the reputation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'll say very little on the first one because there's very little I can say, but in terms of the sale, when it occurs, there will be a due diligence going through the processes uh, that, 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 that I can has to do with. I, I, I've heard lots of rumors myself. I think some of them have, have difficulty when, when being looked at against timelines. But, but all those things will be looked at, you know, within the due process of, of dealing with, with, the trans with the transition of the, of the company and the registry. We have nothing to say about companies being acquired. We, we will look at the, 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 the registries uh, as such, just to make sure that everything is kosher. And that will be done, but that's not something that, that we know anything about at this point. Sale hasn't happened yet. And on the content, I don't know if anybody else wants to take it. I'm not touching it. Yeah. Uh, Martin Sutton, Brown Registry Group. Uh, thanks for the discussion today. I really enjoyed it and the presentations as well. Um, and I concur in terms of uh, the sessions on DNS abuse at the last ICANN meeting, very much worthwhile uh, going and checking out the recordings on those because I think that does help educate people and raise the awareness of what is being said today as well. Um, I'd also like to just point out something and then I've got a, qu a question to David. Um, that uh, First of all, just thinking about the new GTLD landscape, that's offering a very different set of dynamics as well. So we've seen different models introduced, highly restricted TLDs such as dot bank, a lot of dot brands, where there's a lot of control from end to end, uh, from the uh, root of the internet right to the user end. So there is built in uh, security and stability in those designs as well. So we're starting to see different models emerge that will also have a, a positive impact uh, on the DNS, as well as try and figure out collaboratively how we manage the, the negative impacts. Um, and a question really to David was um, just thinking about the uh, uh, requirements of uh, ICANN and your obligations under the bylaws, and specifically around uh, DNS security and stability. Do you, could you give us an illustration of how you engage with uh, the likes of law enforcement to the extent that, you know, do you collaborate with them on a regular basis? Um, and do you work in sort of a scenario like the NCFTA? Uh, uh, National Cyber Forensics Training Alliance uh, in Pittsburgh and others alike, so soccer in the UK, but where there's that sort of cross between law enforcement, um, private industry, and there's that sort of cross fertilization of uh, knowledge and experience. Right, so um, uh, part of my team uh, in the office of the CTO um, works uh, fairly extensively with law enforcement uh, and other public safety and government folks around the world, um, uh, primarily to provide information about what ICANN does and doesn't do to give them um, sort of you know, a better understanding of the tools that are available, um, basically trying to do a knowledge transfer to help um, the law enforcement agents um, execute whatever they need to with regards to um, takedowns or um, uh, you know, trying to go after the bad guys. Um, we also uh, provide um, sort of a trusted introducer service. So um, since we have um, relationships with registries and registrars around the world, um, and frequently um, uh, law enforcement or anti-abuse folks do not know who to contact, they contact us and we provide uh, referrals and introductions. Um, beyond that, uh, we try to be supportive of efforts uh, related to um, reducing DNS abuse. We provide you know, statistics and, and uh, sort of aggregate information, um, but that we make available to the public uh, at large. Um, and Mary Kay, do you wanna? Yeah, there's also the Public Safety Working Group uh, that's part of the, the Governor and Advisory Council. Right now they're under the auspices of the GAC. And so they always meet uh, uh, during the ICANN meetings 
Um, and then also, one of the things that ICANN has done is there are meetings called, technical meetings called DNS OARC. And um, for the last, I think, three years now, ICANN has co-located uh, a DNS symposium day. And in May of this year, it was in Bangkok, and it was the first time I've ever seen this, where they actually, during their, um, the ICANN DNS symposium, they um, collaborated with a lot of law enforcement and security researchers to come in and actually cross-pollinate information so that the folks that usually are just in the DNS realm actually understood some of the issues and some of the depth of some of the issues that law enforcement is seeing. And so I found that by ICANN.org to be really exemplar because it's starting the cross-pollination of law enforcement and the folks that are more in the DNS uh, ecosystem space. Good afternoon, Michaela Nalen, uh, CEO and founder of Black Knight, where the, a hosting provider and registrar, and some of you probably recognize my dulcet tones. Um, David, I didn't know, realize you'd branched out into kind of providing an internet dating service for law enforcement types, but that's an interesting... Uh, um, an internet dating service oh, yeah. for oh, law yeah. enforcement types. Yeah, and we, we refer I mean, I, people I, to you all the time. I hear, you know, that ICANN's looking for new ways of uh, getting a bit of revenue in. I didn't realize that that was going to be the route you were take, uh, very, take. Very lucrative. Very lucrative, okay. <laughs> um, no, on a more serious note, I think the, the topic around um, abuse, which I think is what this session was meant to be focused on, which is primarily around the security and the stability, and I hear people in the room talking about ICANN needs to do more, and in some cases referring to ICANN as if ICANN was industry. It's not. A hell no, you are not industry. You actually barely understand how we operate. So for you to act, for anybody to call you industry is kind of cute, but uh, unrealistic. I mean, the, if I was looking at the slides, I mean, some of the slides are pretty good, but they're oversimplistic and they also assume that there is this direct registrant registrar relationship, which in many cases doesn't exist because a lot of people just get a web thing from somebody. I mean, those of us within industry, um, we are, ha are taking action. Um, many of you may have read the framework to address abuse that um, a lot, some of the largest companies in the ecosystem signed on to in the weeks running up to the last ICANN meeting. But companies that signed on for that were my own company, uh, there was uh, GoDaddy, Affilius, Amazon, Donuts, to name but uh, Newstar, pretty much anybody of any real merit, and there's about 11 companies that signed on, and I, if I've forgotten any, it's, not, it's just because it's a long list. We're able to take action, we're able to say what we will take action on. However, if you go down the route of pressuring ICANN to add more obligations onto registries and registrars, what you're gonna end up doing is penalizing the innocent and enabling the bad guys, because ultimately they, they will always find a way to, to get what they want done. You don't want a situation where it becomes harder and more difficult for small businesses, not-for-profits, individuals to be able to get online. But if you go down the route of adding extra, extra obligations, it's really a case of be careful what you wish for. ICANN is not in a position to, to, to regulate content. ICANN is not in a position to regulate the internet and shouldn't be put in that position. ICANN can act as a facilitator, as potentially offer, offering a forum where interested parties can come together to discuss those kind of issues. But pushing for ICANN to regulate further in the space is a terrible, terrible idea. Please don't do that. Thank you. And I'll just say that's, that's uh, an example of having of why the multi-stakeholder model is so nice at getting multiple perspectives on a particular issue. I, I'll just comment. I, I actually thank you, uh, Michaela, for, for mentioning the framework because one of the things that came out also, and Avi, uh, uh, Avi was kind of mentioning the norms. And so one thing that was made very clear was that the framework really is documenting what a lot of the registries and registrars already are doing and have been doing for a very long time to combat abuse. And so it is a worthwhile read if, if, if anybody's interested. And also somebody had mentioned that the DNS abuse session that was held in Montreal just a couple of weeks ago, the transcripts and a recording is available and there was a really good robust discussion. So it'd be useful for people to listen to that. Hi, it's me again. I'm Jack from Australia. Um, 
if it's Jack from Australia. <laughs> if it helps, Jack Chen from Australia? Yeah. Um, so I understand you can't talk about the, uh, the sale itself. Um, I'm just curious about the, uh, the rationale behind the, uh, the lifting of a price cap that was already passed in July, was it? Yeah, I just want to know why, I suppose. It, it was actually, um, basically, the ICANN organization has been working on bringing all contracts up to the, the base level contract. Each of the people that they go to make a contract with is, is offered the opportunity. Now, one of the things about that new contract is it adds lots of protections. For example, something that is in that contract that isn't in the contract that was previously held are the, um, the public interest commitments that basically require certain actions from a, a registry. And in fact, um, you know, they can commit to, to, to taking other actions, and those can be put in a contract and, and, and be a contractual condition. There, there are other protections that are in that new contract. So one of the reasons is basically that, that the ICANN organization, with the acceptance of the board, has basically been trying to update all of its contracts to these contracts that have greater protection. Some of them, may, I think even some of them affect some of the DNS issues that we talk about in terms of, of risks and such. So, so that is the effort. That includes that particular price cap, but the point on the price cap is that, that from what I've seen, you know, historically, PIR hadn't, and, and, and the purchaser, you know, they had the ability to raise it 3% or something all through the years. They hadn't. And, and the prospective buyer is saying that they also don't pretend, per, uh, intend to do it. Now, we don't know. That's in the future. So, but basically, there's a lot of positive values in that, that new contract. And it is one of the reasons that the org tries to go to that new contract. But, but anyone that is being contracted with could have stayed with the old. They, they, they do have the right to stick within their grandfathered contract. So I would look at some of the protections that that new contract offers to the community and, and, and see how you know, those can work for you. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm just asking the question that people want to know on the, on the internet. Um, uh, would I can release a statement on what they should be looking at in the new protections? Right. Um, well, also the thing is, ICANN is not a, a price regulator, and, and we don't want to be a price regulator. So, so, so that's another part of it. And, 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 and you know, as, as had been discussed, sunny, competition studies had been had done and showed that we weren't really in a position of threat anymore there. It's not an area that, that I can give a great dissertation on simply because I'm not smart enough. But, but, but basically, from everything that was looked at, it wasn't seen as a threat. Sorry, can I, sorry, once again, my name is Abdul Karim. Just a quick one, I think I can see some of, I disagree with some of the things, because in one side we say HICAN is a multi-stakeholder organization that it members us to tell you what to do. And in some cases, when it's convenient, we have this saying that says, oh, ICANN org does not want to be a price regulator. I think that is nonsense. Well, but you haven't told us to be a price regulator. I think that is what the community is saying now. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't <hear> that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, we've got five minutes or something. Anyone else? Jim's, Jimson, the smartest man in the room. Uh, great. Jimson. Yeah, my name is Jimson Ulufuye. I'm in the ICANN uh, com community, uh, business constituency in particular. And I'm pretty aware of uh, the ecosystem, so I just needed to make this intervention. Uh, when you talk about, say, the community, uh, you need to be there and follow the process. 
So, and it's not just one particular constituency that make the final decision, it's everybody. So there's a process. If you want to change, you need to come into the process. Racism is bottom up. It's a bottom up process. And uh, I also like to say that I used to be in the United Nations uh, Commission for Science and Technology for Development Working Group on the Enhanced Cooperation on Public Policy Matters Pertaining to the Internet, uh, Phase 1 and Phase 2. And the whole idea is so that there could be a global framework uh, to look into all these issues, including maybe content. But the community have not got into a place of consensus. And if you read the report of uh, the high-level panel, uh, they're talking about a recommendation of uh, global cooperation, still at the cooperation level, wherein uh, reg regulators and enforcement, I can, they all, all can cooperate. It's an issue of cooperation and collaboration. So uh, as David mentioned, there has to be more cooperation, more collaboration to get this uh, level of abuse tackled. Uh, but at the infrastructural level, at the infrastructural level, yes, he has mentioned it, there is a level of control. But we still have quite a long way to go when it comes to uh, general uh, content uh, uh, regulation and uh, control and enforcement. I don't know if that is uh, clear, Abu Kadir? Yeah, thank you. Could I just add one thing? The actions of ICANN, the organization, are governed by its bylaws. Its bylaws say what it can and cannot do. Policy is a multi-stakeholder bottom-up process. So when we articulate policy, that's when the community comes in. So I hope that distinction is very clear. So our bylaws clearly state we're not regulators. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got time for one more question. Now, I can bring the microphone to someone if uh, you, know, you don't want to stand up here. Or... Anyone at all? Oh, sorry. Klaus? Oh, not you. <laughs> it's way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the way rumors get spread. Anyone else? Perhaps I could ask one question because I think it might be interesting in the context of what you were talking about. Um, the board, as I, I think it was uh, Tripti said, the board discusses a lot of these issues uh, quite, you know, quite in a fundamental sense about what's happening to the domain name system, what's going on outside of the ICANN environment that might affect the domain name system. And you mentioned, you know, the looking at risks or something like that. Do you want to just say a bit more about how how the board looks at uh, how the board looks at external factors? Sure. I guess maybe we'll go down the line. So um, one of the things that uh, uh, ICANN, the board did, was it created a strategic plan, right? And it's a, a five-year plan. And one of it is, uh, one of the, the, um, the mandates also is to make sure that we understand the evolution of the unique identifiers and the DNS overall. And so we have, um, within the board, we have a number of different committees. There is a technical committee, there is a risk committee. And we work with the ICANN org to understand what are the different risks that evolve uh, the evolution of either the unique identifiers and, and potentially different evolutions uh, with DNS protocol um, developments. And so we work very closely then with the risk committee, the, the board risk committee, with the ICANN org uh, uh, risk department to then figure out what um, are some of the, the impacts, right? We, they do a risk assessment. And so then the board has oversight to take a look at what is really important for the entire ecosystem. But we, we basically look to ICANN org to, to tell us what the impact and the potential um, um, ramifications are in terms of these risks. And just to add to that, the um, risk is very broad when uh, the ICANN board looks at it. It's not just at uh, technical risks. It's looking at um, organizational risks, um, financial risks, human resource risks. All, uh, and ICANN org itself has an individual dedicated to risk. So it takes risk very seriously. And as Marike said, there is a committee 
and our chair is sitting right in front of me uh, that um, uh, manages this. So this is something that's very seriously uh, um, looked at within the organization and the board. Um, yeah, I mean, we, the, the, it just covered a couple of, of the issues, but basically almost anything that's going on both within the ICANN community that, that, that the board can be assistive, assistive with or, or help. It, it pays attention to, it has a committee, it has a caucus, it has a working group that basically follow just about every issue that the community is also working on and follows, keeping itself to the point where it understands what's being said in the community and where it tries to really understand the balance between different views because always within the ICANN community, one finds both sides of every issue, if not three, four, five, or six sides of every issue. So the board spends a fair amount of time just really trying to understand what all those facets of perception on, on the various issues are, both internal issues and external ones. And, and, and that's kind of what makes it a, a very interesting task because you walk into the board with one perspective and then all of a sudden you find that there are 23 of them that you really need to understand and balance in order to have any idea of what to, to think. Thank you very much indeed. And with that, we, uh, we have to close. So just the, uh, before the thanks, uh, an advert, if you like. Uh, we have a session uh, tomorrow morning. We have an ICANN open uh, forum at 10.45 where board members, our CEO and our board chair will be uh, available to answer other questions on the domain name system and uh, other issues. And on Thursday this week, we have a workshop on universal access. Uh, I don't think we touched on universal access, but it's something that uh, ICANN take very seriously. The, the ability for all users, whatever scripts, whatever languages, whatever domain names they're using to, to be able to access the uh, internet. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank our panel in the usual way and uh, thank you very much indeed for coming along. <laughs>